General Staff College. We're looking forward to a terrific event. And the film we're spotlighting tonight, 55 Days at Peking, was, was released just a little more than 59 years ago. And we thought we'd start things tonight, set things up Hollywood style with, by, by showing the, the trailer for the movie. It's about three and a half minutes, which is why we're starting about three minutes early. Uh, so we're going to show you the trailer here, and then we'll begin our presentation immediately afterwards. So be right back with you. Enjoy the trailer. Hello again. I'm Steve Weberg. I'm with the uh, Public Affairs Department uh, at the Kansas City Public Library, and, and, and I do want to thank you, those of you here at the Plaza Branch and, and those of you watching from home for, for joining us this evening. We're now seven months into our Hollywood versus History discussion series. Um, tonight's the ninth installment uh, in collaboration with the uh, U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. And I'm going to repeat, I've said this before, I think, a couple of times, how, how essential this, this discussion series has been in our return to normal programming uh, after two years of, of interruption by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have another good crowd here at, at the plaza. Thank you all for coming, for, for joining us. And 
You might also be interested in knowing uh, how popular these discussions have been on the library's YouTube channel, where we archive the videos, uh, and the videos of nearly all of our signature events, uh, making them available for, for later viewing. Our, our eight previous Hollywood versus History events have, have drawn more than 2,000 views, um, you know, subsequent to the actual presentation. Uh, the last one, and I, I'm sure a number of you were here, uh, which revolved around the gate, Great Escape, is being watched an average of 10 times a day, and, and that's before it begins airing on C-SPAN, uh, which sent a crew here to, to film that event, and they haven't started uh, airing it yet on, on C-SPAN, but they'll give us a heads up when, when they do here shortly. So, so just a reminder to, to pass the word that we have this you know, terrific, constantly growing library of, of presentations uh, on our YouTube channel. It's just youtube.com slash KC Library. You can go to it for a full array of programming. Um, tonight, our focus is on 55 days at Peking. And in many ways, it's, it's, a, it's a classic uh, 60s epic. Uh, it, it's got both its defenders and its detractors, as Jeff is, is, is going to talk about, Jeff Babb is going to talk about here. Uh, the detractors, detractors in no small part because of the pretty extensive use of, of Western actors in, in Chinese speaking roles. Um, our speaker, as, as is always the case with the Command and General Staff College, is an, is an authority on the historical subject matter. Jeff Babb is a retired Army Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel who served as a foreign area officer in China and in Washington, D.C. with the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is the, the combat support agency of the Department of Defense, and on the Joint Staff. He's contributed to two volumes of strategic analysis of Army operational environments specifically uh, looking at the uh, America's military role in China. Jeff earned his master's degree in East Asian languages and culture and a doctorate in history, both from the University of Kansas. He's a Jayhawk. Now a professor in the Department of Military History at, at the uh, Army Command and General Staff College, he's spoken three previous times at the library uh, on the history of American military involvement in China, on U.S.-China uh, military relations, and most recently on Douglas MacArthur's dramatic return to the Philippines near the end of World War II. So as always, we'll, we'll have a, a time for a few questions at the end of, of our presentation, and, and we'll ask those of you here at the plaza to make your way up here to the microphones. And because we're live streaming, it is important that you not just shout out from the audience but come to the microphones so that everyone at home can hear the questions as well. And because we are live streaming tonight, those of you who are with us virtually, if you've got a question over the course of the discussion, you can just drop that into the YouTube live chat box and, and we can get those questions presented to Jeff as well. So now, if, if, if you don't mind, please join me in, in welcoming uh, Jeff Babb back to the Kansas City Public Library. Jeff, it's great to have you here again. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be here. Um, it's always fun to, to do these and look forward to the questions at the end. Um, I've been to Peking, but the scenery in here is wonderful, but it's not exactly quite accurate. <laughs> <laughs> this, this whole uh, scene was built in Spain. And as we'll talk about, the Chinese actors in here uh, were every Chinese person in Spain that they could grab, and then they went off and grabbed some from other countries in Europe. So it has some interesting pieces to it. Uh, let me... So... We're used to telling our students, we're going to give you the bottom line up front. So here's the bottom line up front. And so for some of you, you can now leave because you now know the answer. 
historical inaccuracies. I sat down last night and looked at the movie again. I, I have four three by five cards, every line uh, with the historical discrepancies. <laughs> so I'm not gonna go through every discrepancy in this film because that would be impossible. It's two hours and 42 minutes. Um, my last slide, I, I have the uh, site where you can go because the movie um, is on the internet and you can go get it and watch the whole movie. So if, if you like what you saw in the trailer and you find interest in what I'm gonna say over the next 35 or 40 minutes, um, just go watch the movie for free. It is a real event and it gained worldwide attention. With a little bit of help from my friends at the Department of Military History, we went back and found a New York Times article that I will let you read because it certainly shows the racism of the time. And after he was tortured, he didn't change his story. The problem is, it's not true. But it was published in the New York Times that those people that were in the 55 days at Peking, in the legations, had all been killed, and they had actually executed their own kids rather than let them be captured by the boxers. Um, but it's not true. What is true is Western missionaries all over China were attacked, did have to escape, but most of the people killed in the Boxer Rebellions were Chinese Christian converts. And a lot of Boxers that the multinational force killed. It is a multinational force. This colorized picture um, shows the nations involved, and I'm going to try to confuse you as best I can, like, like the history does, of how many nations were involved. Sometimes it says 11, sometimes it says 13, sometimes it says 8, and sometimes it says 5. Officially, when I went to the People's Liberation Army Museum in Beijing back in the 80s, I took a picture of the display they have in the Boxer Rebellion, and they call it the Eight Nation Invasion of China. So for them, it was an invasion. Now, the 55 days at Peking fits into a, a larger conflict, and I'm gonna cover the whole conflict to give you the context uh, for this rebellion and the 55 days in the capital city. The cast members, Laura Robeson, it, in watching the movie, in many ways she's the best character in the movie. And she has the best lines in the movie. She talks about how China views the foreigners that are in China. And talks about why she makes the decision to back up the boxers with Imperial Army forces. And we'll talk about that because when you look at this, there is absolutely no reason that the soldiers, sailors, marines that were defending the legations in Beijing should have survived. Given the numbers, given the fact that they were totally outgunned, it shouldn't have lasted. And the movie does a pretty good job of walking through her decision making of why uh, things happen and a couple others. Now, in, in the book that I'm gonna talk about it at the end, which is the one that I would recommend that any of you wanna read uh, the book, uh, Deanna Preston's uh, The Boxer Rebellion, these are quotes. The only man in China. And then that idea that she developed a taste for power and had the talent for keeping it. She starts out as a concubine, may very well have poisoned one of her own children, 
to stay in power. And absolutely ruled uh, until she died, I think, in 1905. She is, there are books that have been written about the Empress Dowager Sushi, and, and I highly recommend uh, the study of her. She's a very important woman. On the other side, there's the very beautiful Ava Gardner, um, who is completely fictitious. The whole story that revolves around her is completely fictitious. Her brother-in-law, the Russian minister, um, plays an interesting role in here. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have to remember, in 1962, we're in the middle of the Cold War with the Russians and the Chinese. So depicting the Russians and the Chinese as the bad guys fits the era. There are two princes in the movie. In actuality, there are more. And so it's much more complex within the Empress Dowager's cabinet, for lack of a better term. But as you can see, these two non-Chinese folks play actual Chinese historical figures, and they're two of the most important of the figures. Prince Tuan, who's, just as it says, obsessively anti-foreign. And there was another prince, Qing, who was very much in his stead. And there was a general that I'll show later that was ready to carry it out. On the other side is General Yang Lu. Now, in the story, Eva Gardner and her were lovers. In the history, Yang Lu may very well have been um, involved with Su Shi at one time or another. So, welcome to the mixing of history which goes on in virtually every scene. Yang Lo is, is the force of moderation and predicts to Su Shi that if she puts the imperial army against the multinational force of foreigners, they will overwhelm them. Prince Tuan is, it's our time, the boxers are showing the way for us and we'll follow it through. So throughout the movie, they're the two protagonists that, that try to, to change Su Shi's mind one way or another. The military side of the house from the United States is this Captain John T. Myers is the guy that uh, Charlton Heston is meant to be like. But it's wonderful that they didn't call Charlton Heston Major Myers. Major Myers gets wounded in the first few days and is, is lamed up. In the movie, what you get from Charlton Heston is stuff that three different cap Marine captains would have done. Plus, in one scene, he goes on a trip to Tianjin that never happened, that was actually by... Uh, a young Chinese Christian. So Captain Myers is the model for uh, Charlton Heston. On the other side, you have the British ambassador to Claude MacDonald, who's played uh, by David Niven. And this is much better. Uh, the, the way that the character of David Niven is handled is much closer to the reality. However, you see his wife, you see his two children and their little dog, and you see the son get wounded, and none of that seems to be historical. Uh, but he is certainly the leader of the group in the legation, and he is up against it. And, the, and I think the movie does a great job portraying him. The boxers. When you see the boxers in the movie... Um, it's probably the same 3,000 extras just charging all the time uh, and getting killed most of the time. Um, the boxer movement would be its own briefing of, of how it happened in China, how it, came, how it came about, why it came about, and what happened. The scene that you see here is just before Again, a scene that did not happen. 
Prince Tuan invites himself to the Queen's birthday party in the British legation. And he brings with him boxers to do a demonstration. That never happened. As a matter of fact, there are scenes in the, mo in the movie where David Niven and Charlton Heston have an audience with Su Shi. There's no evidence that I've seen that that ever happened. The other problem is, in the scene, Su Shi seems to be, <coughs> excuse me, in the Tiantan, which is a temple in China that's outside of the Forbidden City, but they make it look like it's inside the Forbidden City. So the geography's wrong, the historical reality is, is, is wrong. So at the, tea par at, the, um, at the dinner party, now the dinner party's interesting because they're here, as they're about to go into this war, you see all the finery of the officers and diplomats. That really did happen. There was a very robust social scene in the legations in Beijing. And a lot, some of the movie, especially up front, takes, part, takes place in the hotel, which was a, a real hotel, and it did survive with batterings, but it was very important. Uh, one, because it had a huge larder of food. <coughs> but at the end of the day, what happens here is, who are the boxers? Well, there's a long, long history in China of these millenarian movements, uh, and movements that are that actually spring up some into full revolts, um, and there's one of them that sort of forms one of the dynasties. So, in China, to lose the mandate of heaven is to lose the emperorship, and it happens that peasants have risen to emperor status in China over time. So the Chinese government does not always look the other way. Earlier in um, the Qing Dynasty, of which is where this takes place, 1644 uh, to 1911, there's something called the White Lotus. And it is one of the worst and longest, sort of, it took eight years for the Qing government to put it down. So it's not like they haven't seen things like the boxers before. So big sword, spirit boxers, and then indigent peasants. Because China, in Shandong province, up into the province where Beijing is, was under uh, drought. And so there were hundreds of thousands of young men that had nowhere to go, nothing to do. And they are not led by a leader. Like in the Taiping Rebellion of 1854 to 1864 about where you have a guy that believed he was Jesus Christ's younger brother, Hong Sui Chuan, who brought up the movement. In the Boxer Rebellion, we can't find a leader. It's like every, every uh, church uh, basically built a small group and fired them up and these young men uh, literally went out. Now, they believed that if, that they would be impervious, uh, especially to knife cuts, blade cuts, but even to bullets. And so somebody that got cut badly or killed by a bullet just wasn't praying hard enough. Um, and there were plenty behind them that, that did. So in this scene, Charlton Heston uh, embarrasses Prince Tuan by the way that he handles uh, one of the boxers. And so it looks like it's a personal thing between Charlton Heston and David Divin and, and Prince Tuan. But in, in essence, it just it, it feeds into the narrative of Prince, Prince Tuan being very anti-foreign. So, Spontaneous outburst of people's wrath is the way that Diana Preston talks to it, which is an interesting way to say it. And because it had no leadership, there's a tendency to back up the way she puts it. Who's not in it? One of the key generals that nearly brought the legation down is uh, Dong Fu Xiang. And he commanded the Muslim Gan Gansu Braves. And, and in one of, the pic one of the scenes, 
there's a bunch of mounted warriors that bring a, a notice, um, a memo uh, to the gate. And th those guys are dressed like uh, the Gansu Braves. The Gansu Braves are Muslims. The Gansu Corridor is out in west central uh, China, out past Xi'an. So at the end of the day, these are imperial troops that are very loyal to Su Shi, a nice term, belligerent and volatile. Other groups of imperial forces were not and did not all come together to go with Prince Tuan's idea or follow the empress. They held back, stayed back. But the Gansu Braves were thoroughly behind it and with a little luck could have brought down the legation. There's an in, one of the, the characters that you see through this is a young orphan, Teresa. The picture is of one of the marine captains who is killed in the movie, but actually that did not happen. In the last scene in the movie, uh, Teresa is picked up and put on the back of uh, Charlton Heston's horse. The symbolism is to, to help up the Chinese. There, there's a lot of racism in the movie beyond just not having Chinese actors. Uh, the idea that China needs a helping hand and in some ways, the loss of China in 49 uh, is sort of played out. So at the end of the day, um, we have President Herbert Hoover as a young man, as an engineer, is in China with his wife, Lu. They are living in Tianjin, which is one of the cities that gets attacked. And they together are known for helping Chinese orphans. So it's kind of interesting that in the movie, they put an orphan, they put an American that helps orphans, and they play this strain through the whole movie of taking care of the orphan. Charlton Heston has to go tell the orphan that her father has been killed. And so Charlton Heston plays more of a role in the movie than he really should, and this is no matter. So he has a love affair, with Ava Gardner, and he has to take care of the orphaned orphan. All right, let's go back now and look at the history piece. I've walked through the movie a little bit. Let's look at the history and the context. The context is colonialism, imperialism. And yes, the United States is a part of that, but only two years before when we take the Philippines. So. When we take the Philippines in 1898 and it becomes our colony when we buy it for like $25 million, we are now one of the imperialist colonial powers in Asia. And significant numbers of the forces that will go to Beijing or will go to Northeast China for this come from the Philippines. Adna Chaffee, the commander of the U.S. forces that will go into Beijing, is coming out of the Philippines. And I'll show you those regiments that will go in there later. So you can see that there's colonialism globally. China is a bit different. And then you can see up there how China is being carved up like a melon. This is thoroughly known by the Chinese. And in one of her soliloquies, this is what Su Xi is talking about that China cannot be carved up and they need to do whatever they can to keep this from happening. So you can see the concessions uh, in China and the different foreign powers that have aegis over it. A little bit more context, in 1894-1895 there is the first Sino-Japanese War and the Japanese thoroughly defeat the Chinese, which is the rest of the world doesn't believe it. And part of China then, just across from Korea, 
is given to Japan, however, comma, France, Germany, and Russia will have nothing to do with it and make them give it up. There is a rift between the different colonial powers on how to handle China and what parts of China and how to do it. It is for everybody, according to the Americans. And so the Americans will do something called uh, the open door policy. This is a little bit more, uh, hopefully a little bit clearer on the different parts of China. The other map looks like they were carving up the whole country. It's much more coastal because this is what, what they want is trade. Now what's going to happen up the Yangtze River, the United States Navy will begin to patrol the Yangtze River in 1854, almost 50 years before the Boxer Rebellion. And so from the Shanghai area, we will continue up the Yangtze River with our own patrols. We will have our own steamship companies up there, along with British steamship companies. And we will build railroads, and we'll make the Chinese pay for them. And the taxes that are coming out of these ports are, are being managed by foreigners. A Mr. Hart is basically the Chinese Minister of Finance. And very interestingly, he's seen by both the Chinese and the international community as a fair-minded person. But every rail that's laid down, every foreign ship on every Chinese river and lake is a sign that the country is being taken over and run by the foreigners. This now is called the Century of Humiliation. It begins in 1839 and runs to the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949. And so I'll let you read this. Later in my presentation, I'm going to show you a, a part of a speech by Xi Jinping on the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China in 1921. Um, and you'll see that this, this is still important to the Chinese. What about the United States? The, the, the wonderful non-imperialist, non-colonialist Americans. We're only in it for the trade. Um, we actually live under the mantle of British protection most of the time that we're there. But by 1898 and our capture of the Philippines, we're now part of the colonial peace. But John M. Hay declares the open door policy in 1900. China was never officially colonized. And the Chinese still hold that over India. India was colonized. China was never colonized. There are certainly arguments out there in the scholarship that China was able to avoid this by playing off the different foreign powers against each other. That is not well depicted in the movie. In the movie, the Russians and the Japanese, everybody seems to be getting along in the fight. In reality, the largest contingents are the Russians and the Japanese. And Northeast Asia is what, in, I'm sorry, Northeast China, Manchuria, is where they're vying for power against each other. That will lead to war in 1904-1905, five years after the Boxer Rebellion. So when you're watching the movie and you're seeing the Japanese, who, by the way, were probably the finest soldiers on the ground in Beijing during the Boxer Rebellion. The Marines are wonderful, as the movie depicts, but the numbers and the soldiers that were the most important and probably the most potent were the Japanese. Strangely enough, we start our trade with China in 1794. So being an old New Englander myself and having been to Salem a couple of times, um, the, US, uh, the Empress of China 
taking ginseng to China uh, is in 1784. And then you can watch our path of imperialism across the Pacific. The Treaty of Wangsha in 1844 is where we get most favored nation and extraterritoriality from China, which means if an American sailor does something bad in, in, in Shanghai on port call, only the Americans can take care of it. So rubbing it in the Chinese face is the century, in the century of humiliation, our most favored nation, which means any, any power that gets a treaty with China, the rest of the powers essentially get the same values or the same um, allowances. And then extraterritoriality says, you don't have a legal system that any of us trust. And I see there's a lawyer in the audience, so he can, he can uh, absolutely uh, take that on if I've, if I've talked badly about it. So this is the road that we take to what is now the U.S. Indo-PACOM Theater headquartered in Hawaii. It all starts during this period. So, what is the 55 days at Peking? It is the 55 days from the 20th of June to the 15th of August. The book called 55 Days in Peking is a novel. So the, the movie, truthfully, is based on this novel. But the 55 days at Peking, as you can see, is pretty arbitrary. The first foreign uh, missionary is killed uh, back in December. The Seymour column leaves Tianjin in, on the 10th. Three days later, the first boxers attacked the legation. That should have been the start date. So 55 is not really correct. The 17th, the Allies take the Daku forts. The periodicity of this is not quite right. When the Daku forts are taken, that is the clue for the Empress Dowager to declare war on the foreigners because the foreigners have now invaded China and they had to fight their way through the Daku forts and I'm going to show you where they are in a minute. So then you see the 55 days at Peking. As the Seymour column retreats to Tianjin, the morale of the legation defenders goes down precipitously. <laughs> When they hear about the Allies moving into the Daku forts, it goes up. What the movie does a great job in is showing those changes in emotion as they find out what's going on in terms of their rescue. There are a couple of interesting pieces of, of that as well that are non-historical. A, a priest shows up with a, with a letter. Well, that, that priest acts a little... Um, off his rocker. In, in reality, there was a Dutch priest in the legation that they really had to kind of sedate and put away because he was, but he wasn't the guy that brought the message. So they, they, are, they are very often in this thing, these out of historical figures that show up doing historical things. The regate then, obviously then, U.S. forces attack the Imperial City. In the movie... There's a lot of work done down in the sewers, <laughs> um, sort of. But when the foreign forces take it back, they do use the sewers of Beijing uh, to break into uh, the Forbidden City. And then you can see the parade. The last, the next, well, the last scene in the movie is a depiction of this parade by the foreigners. we will have a protocol signed in a year. So it takes a year, one, to find somebody to talk to in China because the Empress Dowager leaves the city and goes west to Xi'an. So who do you talk to? Who can sign for the Chinese when the Empress is still alive? And so it takes a while to get all of that done. And what gets done in the end is unbelievably humiliating to the Chinese. So. This is the operational context. You can see down at the bottom right, 
That's the Daku Forts. It's not an easy place to take, but the French and the British, with some American naval help, had taken it uh, in, the eight, in 1860. So it wasn't unknown territory, but there were huge mudflats, and the tides caused the naval forces to have real problems. Then you can see the short road up to Tianjin. Obviously, the spelling of Chinese words. Peking, P-E-K-I-N-G, is said and normally pronounced Beijing, B-E-I-J-I-N-G. And if you're in Taiwan, they still call it Peiping, which is not northern capital, it's northern peace. So at the end of the day, um, they have to get to Tianjin and relieve the relief force of Seymour, who's barely been able to make it back. He has, so th there is a, the force under Seymour of about 2,000 had tried to get up and relieve it and had been stopped. Back they went to Tianjin and then they had to be saved. And so if you read anything about Hoover and his time there, it was fraught until the forces get there. There are three ways to get to Beijing. The Beiho River, rebuild and put back together again the rail line, or overland by road. So what this first depicts then is the, the storming of the Daku forts and then um, the battle for Tianjin. Here is the legation. And here are pictures of the buildings within the legations. And when you watch the movie, you're not going to see these buildings. You're going to see much more magnificent buildings. You are going to see this trench that's filled with water. You saw, and so that is certainly there. So the British legation and the American legation, and you can see them on the bigger map. And you can also see that we're right beside the Russian legation. The Chinese houses and Yaman. The Chinese had put together something called the Sunli Yaman, which was under Prince Tuan. Its job it was, was diplomatic, but more liaison. And so the Yaman was just outside, and, and we, you could go there. The German minister is killed in the movie, returning from the Yaman. So this is what the place looks like. This is a map that was actually drawn by Captain Myers. But I thought you ought to see the, the buildings now, you also see here, up at the top center, the Fu. The Fu is a temple. In the movie, the temple, <laughs> the temple is where uh, many different events happen, to include a long dance between um, Charlton Heston and Ava Gardner. You also see up here, Austrian, up to the top uh, right, the Austrian. They virtually had no forces in this. It was all diplomats. Then you see the French. So the French and the Japanese protected the Fu, where most of the Chinese Christian converts were, and they were the ones that suffered the most. The Italians will send, uh, will also move back in, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. So this then is the legation area. And you can see it's not very big. Another picture of it. You'll also see how the legation area shrinks in size over the 55 days. So they set up a defense center, and then they have to keep moving it back. So you have a perimeter on the 20th of June, a line on the 22nd of June, and then the line that that is on the 14th of August. Notice along the wall where the purple lines cross. In the movie, they have to take the wall back and hold it. That's the wall they're talking about. If the Chinese had gained that wall, they would just be able to in, envelope fire in, into the, all the legations. So the Russian legation, the British legation, the American legation are absolutely key to the defense. And outside, you see things like um, the Russian-China Bank, 
right next door to this were all the different businesses that had worked with the foreigners to include stores with storehouses of, of, of stuff that was needed by the legation. So it's a very complex mess. You see these pictures here of the barricades. And there are several scenes in the movie where you see them barricading um, these defensive positions. And David, uh, David Nivens, uh, mother-in-law had given him a complete set of Napoleon's war books that he was happy to put in the um, barricade. Sorry, Mark. All right, here's the numbers, officers and people, uh, officers and soldiers. And you can see this is not a great number of folks. These are the soldiers that are physically in there on the 20th of June. And over 100 of these will be killed and wounded. They'll lose a quarter of, of this force. Also, 75 volunteers with military experience to include David Niven's character, who had been in the British military. Civilian volunteers, 125. And then notice the number of women and children that are in there. And then the number of 2,500 to 3,000, it's not really known how many Chinese Christians were being held in there. And some of them had to leave because there wasn't enough food to feed all these folks. So at the end of the day, then, the tactical geography of the legation you saw, now there's the tactical geography of taking the forbidden city and relieving the legation. So you can see where the legations are. They're within the outer wall. And so when the relief forces come up from Tianjin, they have to breach the gates to get in. And a couple of these gates do have the sewer systems. I think it's the one down south that they, they can break into. Uh, this wasn't exactly the finest hour of multinational operations. Uh, the Russian force was supposed to take the northern gate. They didn't. They went to the southern gate. The Japanese and the Russians were at a, at basically at odds. They had a meeting and decided when to attack, and then both the Japanese and the Russians attacked early. The Brits, the French, and the Americans are down south and generally work together uh, on freeing the legation. In the movie, the first forces from the relief force that you see are Bengal Lancers and Sikh infantry. That, that actually is, seems to be historically accurate. There was a little bit of a tip of who got there first, Adna Chaffee and the 9th Infantry Regiment or the Brit Regiment. But for all intents and purposes, they arrived near, near simultaneously to relieve the legation. I want you to look at the Peitong Catholic Church because this church was recreated in the movie in the wrong place. Okay? This cathedral is outside of the legation. But in the movie, it looks like that this church is being defended from within the legation. It's not. It is being guarded by the French. There are 30 French soldiers up there who actually, for 55 days, keep that cathedral from being taken. Easily should have been taken, but wasn't. That doesn't show in the movie at all. The priest shows in the movie. The priest is the guy that's helping them with the artillery. Now, why would priests help people with artillery? Well, if you can make a, be a bell, you can make a cannon. And so the priest is in, in the movie as their field artillery officer, actually the ordnance officer that helps build it. So who's coming to rescue them? First rec rescue attempt from Tianjin under Seymour fails miserably, they have to fight their way back to Tianjin. They settle in, defend, and then the question is, how many forces do you need to move the 70 miles from Tianjin to Beijing? How long do you wait? Because by now, the nations that had legations in China began to send more troops. So. We're going to have the 9th Infantry Regiment there. There's going to be parts of two more. 
the Brits are going to send more people from India. The Russians and the Japanese are going to pour more soldiers into this. So I've got up here 1,800, I'm sorry, 18,000 will move out in July, August from Tianjin. But right behind them, there's another 50,000 foreign troops. So just as Prince Yang Lo had told Si Xi, if you go to war with the Western powers, they will come in great numbers and they will defeat you, which is essentially what happened. Opposing them, and these figures are crazy. They're all over the place. 50 to 100,000 boxers, and then 60 to 80,000 imperial troops, most of them being led by leaders who want nothing to do with this fight against the foreigners. But from the self-strengthening movement that started in the 1860s, the, Japanese, the Chinese imperial forces have been getting better and better and better all the time. Remington Arms is selling them arms. The French, the Brits are helping them build capital ships. There are arsenals that are being built that will last all the way through the Second World War. So when you see the movie, it looks like they're not well armed. But the imperial troops had access to excellent Western weapons. One of the outcomes of the Boxer Rebellion is to stop the sale of weapons to the Chinese. So, I have a few minutes left, so I'm going to talk quickly about what I call the Hostler method of trying to say an assessment of the movie. So, for the Chinese, bad is Bu Hao. Mama Hu Hu is horse, horse, tiger, tiger. It means so so. Um, Hao Jila means um, great. So, I'll quickly go through the, the, the rating system because I don't have time to go through my four cards. <laughs> There's little historical context. This is the end days of the Qing Dynasty. And is the peak of Western imperialism in China and soon will become pretty much the province of the Japanese and the Russians alone. No parallel coverage of what happens afterwards, which were amazing atrocities, this aftermath. The trials and tribulations of moving across from the Daku forts to Beijing in the summer, in the heat, uh, by these multinational forces. No hint of the aftermath, and then the Chinese victims. The Chinese victims are essentially portrayed by Teresa the orphan. You see virtually no other uh, Chinese civilians that are killed, which was the vast majority of the people that were killed by the boxers. And then the less, less than subtle uh, anti-Chinese overtones. And we got to remember this is 1963. The Chinese have just come out of the Great Leap Forward. They're not looking very good. Um, and, and Mao and Khrushchev are at their apex. So, okay, let's so-so. The historical Chinese players, Prince Tuan, Prince Yang Lo, and Si Xi, I think are quite well done. They're a little bit overwrought, but it works. The rifts and the rivalries between the legation nations could have been played better. The depiction of the boxers uh, is, is overdone. What it should have concentrated a little bit more on what once Si Xi, the Empress Dowager, declares war on the West. The primary forces in this fight are going to be not the boxers, but um, the Imperial Army. So, historical events and sites sort of just don't look very close and don't pay much attention to the geography or the buildings. Other than that, works. So what's really good? I really believe that she, she would be the winner of of any Oscar, although there, there were no uh, Oscars for this movie. The other thing is the depictions of the, of the periodic fighting. They're feeling good one day, then they get hit, and then they're bad. And then they're feeling good one day, and then it's bad. And then they find out Seymour has been turned back, they're feeling bad. That whole episodic changes in the psychology of war, it, I think, is very well done. And then 
It's based on reality. Those 400 soldiers and those other civilians that helped them held the legations until relieved. And it was a long 55 days. What happened afterwards? Uh, at the end of the movie, there's kind of a depiction of these of the different legation, so the different multinational four soldiers coming in uh, to Beijing and having a parade. So there's a picture of it. The United States was supposed to get $12 million to pay. What, we, what, what the foreign powers did was bill the Chinese for the war. What the United States did was take half of that money and begin to bring Chinese students to the United States, actually. The beginning of Chinese students to the United States happens about 50 years earlier, but it, this speeds it up. And arguably, um, this is one of the ideas that, China, that the United States has a special role or a special view of China. The open door policy, we never had a concession like the, many of the other states did. So we didn't have a piece of territory in China that we owned. And this idea here that we were better than the other nations. Adnan Chaffee and the American soldiers after the Boxer Rebellion probably had the best discipline of the force that was there. But like in 1860 in the Second Opium War, the French, the Brits, the Germans, the Austrians, and others went around the city stealing whatever they could steal and did. Xi Jinping last year at, on the 100th anniversary says this. And I'll just let you read it. Notice the Yi He Tuan movement, Boxer Rebellion, is specifically mentioned by him. The hundred years of humiliation is, is one of the drivers of China. And one can argue, as we watch China's response to the recent visit by the Speaker of the House to Taiwan, Never again will they be humiliated. And he, that's what he put out. This speech you know, went out to 1.3 billion people. And this is what 1.3 people believe. I'm at the Army Commander General Staff College in the History Department, and I'm not going to talk about Marines anymore or sailors anymore. <laughs> These are the U.S. Army regiments that were part of the relief of Beijing. Fifth Artillery, Sixth Cavalry, Ninth, Fourteenth, and Fifteenth Infantry Regiments. The Fifteenth Infantry Regiment, the last one, will be permanently stationed in Tianjin from 1912 till 1938. And the relief, we leave in 1938 because China and Japan have begun their war and we don't want to be in the middle of it. Now, for those of you that aren't in the, in the combat arms, there were all kinds of the other folks there because this was logistically a mess to get everything you needed either by road, by rail, or by boat. When the rail lines had been destroyed, the boats, the boats had to be procured, and there are eight nations fighting for the same movement capabilities with not much. Up at the top with the flag in this famous picture uh, is Calvin P. Titus, private medic, United States Army. He will later go to OCS and serve as an officer in the United States Army. But he is a Medal of Honor winner for this 
for getting over the wall or for climbing up to get down to open the gate. So with that, uh, I'll try to answer your questions. Thank you so Best much, Jeff. Tab and P. Titus. Microphones here in front. Um, I, I, one quick question to start. I, I believe this movie was immediately banned in China, and was that related to the sensitivity to the Hundred Years' Humiliation, or? It, to the best of my knowledge, in the 1960s, that wasn't a, as big a deal as, as it's been made lately. Uh, but I, I would not, I, 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 I do not know whether it was banned in China. I'd have to look that one up, but it would make sense. Question there While we're waiting right? for another question, um, if you want a quick read, uh, David Silby's uh, Boxer Rebellion and the Great Game in, in China is excellent. And then the book that I've talked about in here, The Boxer Rebellion, the dramatic story of China's war on foreigners that shook the world in the summer of 1900 by uh, Diana Preston. I really think this is a great book to read on it. And then if you don't like reading um, and you don't like history, then go to Osprey and you can get the quick editions with all kinds of pictures. <laughs> Sir. What about the blowing up of the ammunition depot? Was that fact or fiction? Fiction. What was blown up was the arsenal, the, the arsenal in Tianjin. So nice juxtaposition of the geography. Yeah, that was totally fictitional. But fascinating though. Yes, <laughs> yes. But to think that the British ambassador to the the British ambassador to China is going to get dressed up like a boxer peasant, crawl through the sewers with a U.S. Marine to blow up an arsenal uh, leaves a little bit to be desired. <laughs> Thank you. How many uh, American soldiers were killed in the bo Boxer Rebellion, do you know? Um, I'm sorry, I had it in here and I should have looked it up. It, it's uh, killed and wounded around 200, 250. 250, thank you. And that was in that difficult fight from the Daku forts to there. There are no soldiers uh, in, in the fight in, in, in Beijing. It's with that relief force. Yep. I thought I'd marked it in here, so if, if I had a minute, I could pro Yep. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. Thank all of you again for coming this evening, and we'll look forward to the continuation of this series.